This is John Whitaker for the probability uh, graduate level class, and this is our 15th video lecture. And last time we left off uh, mentioning about limit theorems and had done two uh, preliminary theorems, one called uh, Markov's inequality and the Chebyshev's inequality. And so uh, I'd like to give an example today uh, where we use those two initial inequalities. Uh, I'd also like to talk about uh, how we have the uh, joint PMF or PDF for more than two random variables. Um, and I would also like to present to you the weak law of large numbers. Okay, so <clears throat> let us get started by recalling uh, one was Markov's It says, if x is a non-negative random variable, and a is greater than zero, then the probability that x is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to the expected value of x over a. And two, Chebyshev's inequality <clears throat> here it says uh, let x be a random variable with finite mean, that's expected value, equal to mu, and finite variance, here that's variance of x equal to sigma squared, then, uh, and I should say, k be greater than zero, then the probability that the absolute value of x minus mu is greater than or equal to k is going to be less than or equal to the variance of x over k squared, and of course that's equal to sigma squared over k squared. So those are the two things that we have. And the next thing we want to do is do an example of those. So as an example, uh, let's, su let's say, um, suppose the number of specific items Produced in a factory in a week is denoted by X. Okay, so uh, a random variable. So for this given week, x of that given week yields out the uh, number of items that were produced. Okay. Suppose it is known that on average, there are 500 items produced. Okay. The first 
question says, what can be said about the probability that the number of items produced in a specific week is greater than a thousand. Then the next question our next part of this problem has to do with the variance. Before I, I go away from this, this is going to use Markov's inequality. And now the next part, part B, asks if the variance of x is known to be said about the probability that the number of items produced Let's remember part A for a second. So we know that uh, we're being asked for part A. The probability that the number of items uh, produced is greater than or equal to 100. So this says x is greater than or equal to, not 100, but 1,000. Well, x is the, represents the number of items uh, that are produced in a given week. And so uh, what I think of about x, what I notice about, is that it's non-negative, okay? You're not going to produce a negative number of items. And when you're asked the probability that x is going to be greater than or equal to 1,000, using uh, Markov's inequality, we know that this is less than or equal to the expected value of x over a here, which is 1,000. So um, the expected value of x is 500, and this will be over 1,000 to 1 half. So the chance that you get over 1,000 is definitely less than 1 half. How much less? We cannot say, but we get some value. For part B, having to do with the variance, first of all, what we're being asked is what's the probability that x is uh, in between um, 400 okay, and 500, uh, I'm sorry, 600. In this manner is the way I'm going to write it. And what that's the same thing as is the probability that the absolute value of x minus 100 is going to be um, less than uh, 100. So uh, we're looking for all the outcomes whose distance, uh, not from 
100 from 500, I should say, is less than 100, and that gives you all the numbers between 400 and 600. So that's what we're being asked to do. Well, that doesn't quite fit um, Chebyshev's inequality. Chebyshev's inequality has the, absolute, the probability of the absolute value of x minus uh, the mean. Here's the mean. It's going to be greater than or equal to a number. So here, I'll rewrite this as 1 minus the probability that the absolute value of x minus 500 is greater than or equal to 100. So that's what we're looking for. So, uh, note the probability that the absolute value of x minus 500 is greater than or equal to 100 um, is less than or equal by Chebyshev's inequality. Uh, the variance of x, which was 100, I think, over this k squared, which is going to be 100 uh, squared, and that's equal to 1 over 100. Okay. So, the probability, going back to the original problem, 400 is less than, uh, x is less than 600, is uh, going uh, to be equal to 1 minus the probability of x minus 500 inside absolute value greater than or equal to 100. Now, what we're taking away here from 1 is some number that's less than 1 over 100. Okay? So the max we could be taking away is 1 over 100. So this quantity is going to be greater than or equal to 1 minus 1 over 100, um, which equals to 99 over 100. So um, that gives you a good indication of uh, that X is likely to be between 400 and 600. So in our first problem, we used Markov's inequality, and we said, well, what's the chance going to be over 1,000? Well, we knew it was less than 1 half, but it turns out it's going to be way less than 1 half because here in Shevichev's inequality, it says, hey, if you be between 400 and 600, the likelihood of that happening is greater than 99 out of 100. So that's what we did. All right, um, the next thing I want to do is give a definition. And it says uh, of the joint PMF. So given random variables, x1, uh, let's say uh, discrete random variables, x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xn, the joint uh, probability mass function of x1, x2, all the way up to xn is a function f of x1, x2, all the way up to xn, um, given by, defined by, f of x1, comma x2, x3, all the way up to xn, is equal to the probability that random variable uh, x of 1 is equal to little x of 1, and random variable x of 2 is equal to little x of 2, and all the way up to xn equals to little xn. So that's the definition for a joint uh, PMF when you got more than two random variables. It's just an extension of what we had. We can also extend the definition of a joint PDF to more than two random variables.
And we'll do that next. It's a little bit hazy. There we go. So um, the next definition is uh, random variables x1, x2, all the way up to xn are said to be jointly continuous. If there exists a function f x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xn, uh, such that for say over a n, a n minus 1, let's just uh, keep going all the way down to finally a 1, of f of x 1, x 2, all the way down to x of n, and then this will be dx 1, dx 2, all the way up to dx n. Okay, that's our definition of what it means for random variables to be jointly Continuous. And in this case, f of x1, x2, all of xn uh, is called the joint PDF, probability density function, of, you guessed it, x1, x2, all the way up to xn. That definition can be helpful to us working with more than two random variables at a time, those two definitions. I'm not going to do an example, but rather I'm going to turn to an extension of another definition that we have, and that is uh, independence. Here's the definition. We're going to let x1, x2, xn be random variables then the collection x1, x2 of, of xn are said to be independent random variables if for all a1, a2, an element, oh, I'm sorry, subsets of R, the probability 
that x1 is an element of a1, x2 is an element of a2, and xn is an element of an, is equal to the product of product times the probability x2 is an element of a2 times, we'll keep multiplying, we get to the last one, the probability of xn is an element of a. That's very similar to what we had, it's just an extension. Okay. <clears throat> now, another definition that I want to cover says that um, the random variables, and I'll just do it with two random variables. X1 and X2, but this could be extended as well, are said to be uh, identically distributed. So this is some prefacing material for our next limit theorem, for our first limit theorem. Uh, distributed. are either the PDFs or PMFs of X1 and X2. And let's look at a very quick example of this. So let's uh, suppose a coin is false. Okay. And we let X of 1 of heads equal to 1 and X of 2 of tails equals to 2. Suppose an urn contains three white balls and three red balls. A ball is selected at random. Zero at at, uh, at one, and the chance that x of one is equal to one, that's what this is, these are PMFs, that's equal to uh, one half, f sub x of two of uh, two is also equal to, I'm sorry, one is also equal to one half. Note, f of x of two, that's about the ball being chosen, well, when is it one? When we uh, got a white ball, what's the chance we got a white ball? Well, there were three whites and three reds, so uh, the chance we got a white ball is three out of six when we just choose one time, so that's one half. And f of x of two of two, well, that's the chance we got a red ball. That's also equal to one half. Just let me conclude up here.
Thus, x1 and x2. Do you remember we're talking about two different things? They are identically distributed. I had talked about independence a few minutes ago with the collection of random variables. And it turns out, if you, it turns out that if you're independent, then your joint PMF PDF uh, is equal to the product of each individual PDFs or PMFs. And uh, that's going to be important to uh, be used when we describe this limit theorem. So we, this is our first limit theorem called the weak law of large numbers. It says, uh, let x1, x2, up to xn, be, I, uh, be uh, a collection or a sequence of Independent and identically distributed what we normally abbreviate that by is uh, independent is the first I and identically distributed so IID a random variable Each having finite uh, mean, so expect the value of x, whatever, they're all the same, they're mu. Because they're identically distributed, then their means are all the same. We call them mu, we're saying that they're finite. And so then, For any epsilon greater than zero, then the probability that x of one plus x of two plus all the way up to x of n over n minus mu is greater than or equal to epsilon, that that probability goes towards zero as n goes towards infinity. This is a type of convergence. It's called convergence in probability. We'll talk about different types of convergence as well for functions. Well, that's the statement, and the statement can be proved with the hypothesis that are given, but I'm going to add something. So, uh, so that this looks a lot more like uh, a situation where we can use Chip chips inequality. I'm also going to assume that there's finite variance. So, so proof. Well. <clears throat> X1, X2, Xn, and forever. B, uh, independent and identically distributed. Random variables. Then, um, or with, I should say, finite, um, each with finite, excuse me, mean, that's it, 
respect to value of x sub i in point to mean. <clears throat> we will also assume so this is not part of the statement so we're going to do the proof under one more assumption uh, each random variable has finite Variance. And we can give it a name. Uh, the variance of x of i is equal to sigma squared. So they all have the same uh, variance. Okay. Now, I said we were going to use in this addition, with this additional. Hypothesis of finite variance. We're putting ourselves in a position where we can apply Kipchev's inequality. But to apply Kipchev's inequality, remember what it is we want to show. We want to show that the probability of x of 1 plus x of 2 plus all the way up to x of n over n, that got minus mu, it, uh, the chance of it being greater than or equal to epsilon uh, is going to go towards zero, okay, for, for epsilon greater than zero, for any epsilon greater than zero. And so, I don't have to let epsilon be greater than zero, I ain't done that yet. But this x of 1 plus x of n, all the way up to x of n over n, um, is going to be, for Chebyshev's inequality, like my random variable x. And so we're saying x minus its mu, well, we've got to make sure that the mu here is the mean of this particular function is the mu, so that I can apply Chebyshev's inequality, uh, is less than or equal to epsilon. Remember, that's going to be less than or equal to the variance of this quantity okay, over uh, epsilon uh, squared, so I need to know what the variance of this quantity is. So I need to verify that the expected value of this is mu and find what the variance is of this. That's my two goals. Okay, so here we're going to let uh, epsilon be greater than zero be given. So, um, uh, note the expected value of x1 plus x2 plus all the way up to xn over here. So let's look at this guy. Well, this is equal to, I pull out the 1 over n. I'm left with the expected value of x1 plus x2 plus x in. Now, um, here it turns out, because of uh, working with the uh, PDS or PMS or these random variables, you could show that this is equal to okay, 1 over n times the expected value of x of 1 plus the expected value of x of 2, plus the expected value of x of n. That's what we're doing. Check this. And that's equal to 1 over n, and then for each one of these expected values, you've got mu, plus mu, plus mu, plus all up to mu again. How many mu's do we have? So it's 1 over n, n mu's, which is just equal to mu. That's what I'm doing. Now, consider the variance 
x of 1 plus x of 2 plus x of n over n. Well, by formula, I know that the variance of this quantity is equal to the expected value of this quantity to be squared minus the expected value of this quantity whatever that is, which we already know, is mu, to be squared. So I need to work on this. Well, the expected value of x of 1 plus x of 2 plus, plus x of n over n to b squared. I'm going to multiply this out. Well, the n squared in the bottom, so I get the expected value of x1, oops, I need that. x1 plus x2 plus x. 3 plus, plus x of n time x of 1 plus x of 2 plus, plus x of n. All that over n squared. And n squared is a constant, I can pull it out. And so now when I multiply this out, what do I get? I get the expected value. So x1 times all this. It's x1, x1 plus x1 times x2, plus, and you keep going, and you get all the way up to x1 times x of n. Now I'm done with that first x1. Plus, here this is the expect, uh, this is going to be x1, I'm sorry, x2 times x1, plus x2 times x2, plus all the way up to x2 times x n. And you're going to keep going. And eventually you get to x n times x1 plus, and you keep going to the last term there is xn times xn. Now it turns out the cause of the identically distributed, well, uh, not without the identical perfect script, but it can be shown that this is equal to 1 over n squared, and, well, let's write out n squared. Um, this will be the expected value of each one of these parts. So expected value of x of 1, x of 1, plus the expected value of x of 1, x of 2, plus all the way up to the expected value of x of 1 times x of n, plus uh, the expected value of x of 2 times x of 1, plus the expected value of x of 2 times x of 2, plus uh, all the way up to the expected value, adding together x of 2 times x of n, and then you keep adding, and eventually you get to this last term, so it's 1 over n times all this, uh, plus the expected value of x of n times x of 1, plus <clears throat> all the way up to x of n, the expected value of x of n times x of n. So this is equal to 1 over n squared. And now, in that 
previous list of expected values, what you'll see is you have the expected value of x sub 1 squared uh, plus uh, uh, expected value of x sub 2 uh, squared and a bunch of just the one squared, which I'll rewrite as just a sum. As I want, runs from 1 to n of the expected value of x sub i squared. So that's one thing. Okay. Plus, now how do I describe the many more terms that we have? Well, well I'm just going to write down sum. I'm not going to say how many there are. But it looks like we have the expected value of x sub i times x sub j. And here we're thinking i and j are different from each other. And I don't even know how many of those I have. Okay, so I'm not putting some kind of uh, way of uh, figuring that out. Just some kind of sum. That's what I'm denoting that by. This is 1 over n squared <clears throat> times the sum as i runs from 1 to n of the expected value of x sub i squared. I'm going to leave that alone for right now. Plus, well, um, here, due to independence, this is going to be um, I don't well I, I kind of need to figure out how many they're going to be. But for due to independence, let's just write that this is the expected value of x sub i times the expected value of x sub j. So independence will give us that. So well, that's equal to 1 over n squared. Sum as I run from 1 to n, expected value of x sub i, d squared, plus, well, this is x sub j. Uh, here's what I'm going to tell you. This is mu, and so is this. So, really, it's mu squared plus mu squared. But how many mu squares do I have? Well, how many terms do we have? where we had two different x of whatever, x of whatever else, two of them. And so the way that those pairings happen is that you pick um, uh, two of them from your x of 1 through x of n to be multiplied together. How many ways could I pick two of them, two different ones? There's n, uh, choose two of them. That's how many ways. So you'd have x of 1, x of 2. You'd have x of 1, x of 3. There's n choose 2 uh, number of ways of picking two of them. And the order doesn't matter because you say x of 1, uh, x of 2, x, x of 2, x of 1. They're the same. Except, wait a minute, they are listed there twice. So here when I say order doesn't matter, n uh, choose 2 of them, uh, we have x of 1, x of 2. We do have expected value of x of 1, x of 2, and the expected value of x of 2, x of 1 involved. So I need to multiply this by 2. Okay, um, here we can think of, because they're identically distributed, that the expected value of x, whatever one we have here, to be squared, that its expected value is going to be the same for all the i's. So whatever this is, there's the same. And so what I'm going to say is this is the same thing as n times the expected value of x of 1 uh, to be squared. And I have n of them that I'm adding together, so I multiply them by n. So that's what I have. Plus, here this is 2 times, well, n choose 2, that would be n uh, times n minus 1 over, well, it should be n factorial over n minus 2 factorial, which I'm going to write down n times n minus 1. And that, the rest of the n minus 2 down to 1 will cancel out with n minus 2 factorial down here. And then times 2 factorial, so these are the ones, mu squared. And that's equal to 1 over n squared times n times the expected value of x of 1 squared. Plus, here we can think of this as n times n minus 1 mu squared.
So, what is the variance of uh, the variance of x of one plus x of two? That's what we're working for, all the way up to x of n over n okay. is equal to. Remember, is the expected value of this. squared minus right over the expected value well you know I already have this it's minus mu squared and so that's equal to uh, 1 over n squared so I'm looking at the other board here this would be times n times expected value of x of 1 squared and then plus 1 over n squared times n squared times the expected value, I'm sorry, times mu squared plus 1, oh, it'd be minus, minus 1 over n squared, that's that original one, that's the 1 over n squared, times uh, n times mu squared, and then minus. Uh, mu squared. This is equal to 1 over uh, n times the expected value of x sub 1 to be squared, plus here it is a mu squared, and then it's minus 1 over n uh, mu squared, minus mu squared. These two mu squareds would cancel with each other. So I'm left with 1 over n times the expected value of x of 1 squared uh, minus 1 over n times mu squared. And I can factor out the 1 over n. And what I'm left with is the expected value of x of 1 squared uh, minus mu squared. But the expected value of, well, first of all, what was mu? Mu was the expected value of each random variable. So this would be thought of as the expected value of x sub 1, and then we're squaring it. So this quantity right here is nothing more than the variance of x sub 1, which is equal to 1 over n times sigma squared. And so we're assuming that's finite, that's what we are. So, the probability that x of 1 plus x of 2 plus all the way up to x of n over n inside absolute values minus mu is greater than or equal to this positive epsilon. You, we can apply Chitty Chips in the problem now. So this part right here, this function right here, this random variable, we know that its expected value is mean. So we're taking this uh, random variable, subtracting its mean from it, inside out of values. What's the chances greater than or equal to this epsilon? The answer by Chitty Chips inequality is the variance of this, which we found to be 1 over n, and then times sigma squared, all over epsilon squared. So we have that zero is less than or equal to this probability. So it's got to be greater than or equal to zero. Probability of the absolute value of x of 1 plus x of 2 plus, plus x of n over n minus mu is greater than or equal to epsilon is less than or equal to rewriting this. I'm going to say sigma squared over n times epsilon squared. Now, if we take the limit as n goes to infinity, note the limit as n goes to infinity of zero, that's just zero, and the limit as n goes to infinity 
of sigma squared, that's a big number, over n times epsilon squared. Well, these are just numbers, okay? So um, when I have n getting bigger and bigger and bigger, we think of this is combining to be a number at the top. When I have this fixed number divided by n as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this goes to zero. So by a uh, The limit as n goes to infinity, uh, I should say one. So by uh, the squeeze theorem, for sequences. Okay. So what we have here is we consider these two outer guys as sequences that bound this middle guy. And since the outer two guys are going towards zero, the middle guy also has to go towards zero. And that's what we wanted to prove. So that concludes the proof of the weak law of large numbers under that additional assumption. I said that the weak law of large numbers it has to do with the convergence and probability. So what I want to end the day with is just barely starting uh, different types of convergence for functions. We'll spend just a little while talking about those. So um, Definition. Um, this is more of an analysis than it is probability. Here's what we say. We say um, that f sub n be a sequence of functions. Suppose for each x that's an element of A, the sequence L sub n of that particular x converges. So this is a sequence of numbers. So, in this case, we say the sequence f sub n of x, so 
absent in the sequence of functions. The sequence of functions. Convergence. I don't like the way we say it. We say the sequence of functions. F sub n. Converges pointwise to F and on A. I'd like to look at one example and we'll call it this. So my example is we'll let F sub n of X equal to um, x to the n be defined on 0 to 1. Then the sequence s of n converge pointwise to L defined by is 0 if x is an element from 0 to, to 1 but not including 1, and uh, it's equal to 1 if x is equal to 1. And I'm just going to illustrate this with a picture over here. So my picture is the following. All right. So we're just looking from 0 to 1. And uh, the first function, f sub 1 in my sequence, is f sub 1 is equal x to the n. So f sub 1 is equal to x to the first. I know what that is. That's the, the function's the line, y of x. Then the next function in my sequence, so this is f sub 1. The next function in my sequence is f sub 2, which is x squared. Well, I know what x squared looks like. It looks like this. That crap. The next cubed also looks like that. The next to the fourth. And so forth. And what happens when we think of pointwise convergence is that you give me any point, let's say this one, and you look at the output values here, 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 here. As we go higher and higher in terms of the sequence of functions and look at their output values, they're getting closer and closer to zero. Okay? Zero right here. Not on the y-axis, zero. And that's going to happen for every point that's in between zero and one, except one, because at one, f sub one, f sub two of one, f sub three of one, all of those are one. And that's how we get the big F as the limit, and it converges point. All right, that's enough for today. Thank you very much for your time and patience.